welcome back to Home Farm on Dumfries South Estate. Um, today we want to take you for another little behind the scenes tour, um, mainly focusing on Home Farm, what's been going on with our poultry. Um, and today in the background you can hear it's very busy, very noisy. Today is shearing day, so they are clipping the fleeces from the sheep. Um, that'll cool them down for hopefully some more summer weather. And as well as that, as well as looking at what happens here, our tutor Iona is going to take us to have a look at what happens on her farm at home, a hill farm, where they've also been shearing their sheep as well. So, let's go. So one of the good things about doing the tour this way is we're able to get a bit of behind the scenes um, look at things that our usual farm tours and our usual workshops wouldn't do. So behind me is the entrance door to the hatchery, which is where Denise, our education farmer, brings on a lot of our young birds. And um, so we're going to just go and have a wee look just now. Okay, so welcome to the hatchery. So in here just now, we have our incubators on the go and the inside of the blue incubator I will show you in a little moment. Okay. Another style of incubator on the go with some chicken eggs in. And then if I just slide over here. So this is where our young birds will be for the first few days of their lives. Um, we've actually got some young ladies here who aren't that young who have been on weed and pest patrol in the gardens but today are actually heading up to Valentin's farm. So they're just in here for a health check and um, they've had rings put on their legs so Denise can identify which year they hatched out because very soon they will look exactly the same as all our older birds. Denise has kindly set out some eggs for us um, and very quickly you can already tell, I'm just going right from above, there's a size difference, there's colour differences as well. So at the front here we have some of our eggs from our Scots grey hens, I think on this side, and our dumpies over this side. So you can see they're a relatively small, but still an alright size, um, of a chicken egg. Possibly slightly, maybe on your medium size from what you would find in the shops. This one's definitely smaller, probably from a younger bird just starting laying. This one, even though it's from the same birds, it's a bit bigger. So they do tend to size up as the bird gets a bit older. Second line, these eggs you can see are a bit bigger. So we've got a very smooth white to grey style of egg here. You can see the size difference again between these two eggs. These are from our ducks, so a similar shape to our chickens. I'll just bring you one up next to it to see. But definitely a bit bigger. As I've already said, great for cake making. This side, this beautiful speckling goes with the breed of um, animal it comes from. So not just the animal itself, you will get different specklings, different colours from, when, from within the type of bird. These are from our black and white pied crowlets or turkeys. So they've got this brown speckling. They're a little bit rougher than a duck egg. But the main thing that you can almost tell these turkey eggs part with from the others is they've got a pointed top. So a really deep base and a pointed top. And last but not least, up the top here, these are a very matte, um, not a shiny surface, not as smooth, almost like a fine sandpaper. Um, and these eggs are significantly bigger. So this is from our geese. So I'll show you the goose. In fact, bring them down here. Our turkey. Our duck and our chicken. <laughs> there you go. And the other significant difference here are chicken eggs will take 21 days to hatch when they're being incubated, but all these others will take 28 days. There or thereabouts, just like humans, it can take a bit longer, a bit shorter. But the bigger eggs need that bit longer to develop. Um, so the goose egg is what we're really interested in today. And that's what we've had a 
few of hatching out over the last day or so, which is really exciting. They're not the easiest things to get hatched, um, but I think Denise has cracked it now. She's got a system sorted that seems to really work um, and help with our success rate for hatching out goslings, so baby geese. So a quick overview of the hatching process. So we've got a brood of goose here who has decided to sit on a clutch of eggs and we'll let her get on with that. She's going to hatch those out for herself. But it isn't every goose that decides to go broody or every chicken or um, duck. Um, so what we want to do to increase these numbers of these rare breeds is we take some of these eggs and we incubate them for ourselves. So you can see here we've got a clutch of goose eggs um, and they've been in this incubator now for about 27 days. They have been kept at the right temperature, um, the right moisture content, and they've been turned to make sure basically that the, the gosling inside doesn't get stuck in the egg. So you can see a few of them have pipped, as in there's cracks in the shells, they are starting their hatching process. Um, and there's one on the right hand side that has a little wobble from time to, uh, time to time, so it's a nice little reminder that there's a fully formed gosling in there just ready to come out. So less than 24 hours later, this is what we have. Um, you can see the one on the left, it hatched out a bit sooner, um, it's dried off, it's lovely and fluffy, so it's ready to go um, under the heat lamp um, in our little container box for the goslings. And in less than two weeks, this is the size they get to. They're absolutely massive, they grow so quickly. Um, so they're out, you can see, they're grazing away quite happily, they know exactly what to do. Um, and this pen will have to be moved at least twice a day to make sure they've got enough fresh grazing. Um, they're most happy in a family group like this. So it's been really good this year. We've been able to hatch out um, a few sort of groups of goslings together. Um, and again, just moving on, you can see that they have increased in size again dramatically. So the one at the front is only three weeks ahead of the other behind it. Um, so you can see the colour out and start to look adult very quickly. Today is shearing day on home farm, um, so that is why, as I mentioned earlier, it's so noisy the sheep are being moved about and brought into the shed for shearing. So we've got about 600 or so ewes here who will be shown today. The lambs aren't, um, they um, will keep their fleece that they've grown for their first season. The job here of the three professional shearers is basically to make sure these sheep are handled carefully, they're shorn as quickly as possible and as cleanly as possible, so we want that fleece off in one nice big um, lump. The other person that's there is the wool packer or Rousey, so her job is to make sure that the fleeces are removed um, from the area that the shearers are working, um, are clean and packed away um, into the wool bags. So first job is heading out on the motorbike with sheepdog Jim in tow to bring the sheep into the shed from the field. These sheep here all had twins at lambing time back in April. It's really common in sheep to have twins, about half of our sheep do. 
So these ones here have been kept in the field since lambing time rather than being put back to the hill as there's much more grass in the fields to help the ewes, which is the name for female sheep, produce more milk for their lambs. So now the sheep have been brought into the area outside the shed to split the lambs from their mums as the lambs can go back out to the field while the ewes have their woolly coats taken off. The ewes and lambs are then put down a narrow passage called a shedder and you can see my dad using the gate to put the ewes one way and the lambs the other. This makes life so much easier. This job needs a lot of concentration as it is really easy to get things mixed up. Firstly, Dad needs to catch the sheep from a small pen before turning them onto their back. The action of taking the wool off is called clipping or shearing. Nowadays, electric shears are used, which makes the job much faster than it used to be when these weren't available. Hand shears were used by previous generation, which are basically just like a large pair of scissors, making the job much more difficult and time consuming. The position the sheep is put in is critical to how easy or difficult the experience is for both man and sheep. They have to be at a comfortable angle that ensures they don't struggle. Shearing causes sheep no pain at all, it's just like us getting a haircut, and it's crucial to remove the wool as if it was to be left on it could cause health problems that we will learn a wee bit more about later on. The sheep is manoeuvred into different positions to make sure all parts of the body are reached, including the stomach and neck. It is much more common nowadays for farmers to employ contractors to come in and shear sheep for them, like you will have seen at Dumfries House Home Farm, as it is much less time consuming, allowing all sheep to be sheared in one day for these farmers. The wool is then rolled up and packed tightly into a wool bag. These bags are then stitched up with string, ready to be sent off once all sheep are clipped. As a welfare issue, although it's not cost effective, the wool still has to come off the sheep because, because um, it would just grow more and more and, and the, the sheep would suffer heat stress in the summer and the, in the moist wet conditions it gets smelly and it attracts flies and you get maggots in them so you, you, they have to be clipped anyway for welfare reasons. Um, well, the professional shearers, there's gangs of shearers. Most of the sheep in this country are actually sheared by um, professional shearers that go around in gangs. And these, 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 uh, these people can clip three and four hundred sheep a day comfortably. Um, unfortunately, this year, because of the travel restrictions, there's a lack of shearers in the country. So the New Zealanders usually come over for the shearing season over here. So. Um, they haven't been able to come this year, so the, the Scottish lads and lasses are on their own this year when it comes to shearing, I'm afraid. So, um, me myself, I just, I've got, I just clip one sheep, I've got roughly 1,200 to clip, and uh, I'd take the dry. You can't clip them when the, when, when the fleeces are wet, because they could be stored, so if they're wet, they don't clip any, and it's a nice dry day, I'll, um, I'll go and get a batch. 
question. Um, I tend to find a, a sheer a bit quicker when I've got Metallica on the earphones. <laughs> Um, well, these are Scottish blackface sheep we have on this farm because it's a hill farm so these sheep spend 12 months a year out on the hills and the mountains um, of Scotland, Northern England and Ireland so they're, 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 because uh, of the conditions they live in the wool is, is coarser because it's to the weatherproof to shed the rain and snow so because it's coarser, it can't, the rules from these breeds, the mountain breeds, can't really be used for knitwear items. Um, but it's very good for carpets. This quality blackface wool goes for carpet production because, again, because it's coarser, it's harder wearing. Um, and it's also used, mattress stuffing is a big one. Um, we use it for that uh, as well. This is a typical uh, blackface uh, piece here. You see, you've got the. Um, there is a coarseness, there's hair, a certain amount of hair through it and inside of the yellowness is actually, it's very oily to feel and that's the lanolin which um, waterproofs the, the wool for the sheep through the winter and it's actually used, it's very soft, um, creates a very, your hands are very soft and um, smooth and it, it, it's used for makeup and creams um, when it's taken out the wool. The sheep basically want to shear them as early as they can in the summer, but you can't shear them before they're ready. And the, 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 when the grass comes on, the, the sheep start to grow the second, another fleece. So you get what is known as the rise, which is the new fleece coming through the skin, and it creates a gap between the, the, the skin and the old fleece. So you've got to wait uh, until the, the sheep have a certain amount of rise on them. Um, so you can, uh, that's where the clippers go to, to take the wool off. Um, but it's as early in the summer as you can get because you, you want the wool off from, especially for the bit of heat, you know. So, and, and I think sheep actually thrive better with the wool off. They do better. So, uh, early as we can manage, but we can't go too early. So, that's the end of another day on the farm. I hope everybody's enjoyed coming along with us today and hopefully, see you again in another video soon. Yeah. Alright, so I'm up here with uh, Denise, our education farmer, um, and we've had a few questions from you about different things on the farm from our last video. So the first one was about what on earth are those things on the chicken's legs? So I'm just going to zoom in and show you. All you right. mean the ankle bracelets? <laughs> the ankle bracelets. Okay, so yeah, tell us what they're all so about, Denise. The ankle bracelets or the leg rings, pulsary leg rings, are actually two um, different colours for different years of hatch. So these yellow ones were hatched out last year, 2019. Brilliant. So she's coming up to one year old. Excellent. So it lets you know what you've got and what kind of age your birds are just on first sight. That's right. Fantastic. That's right. Excellent. And this year's colour is green. Green. One more question to answer. Um, you'll notice that on our pigs that they all have a little button in their ears, so an ear tag. Why do they have such a thing? So um, the ear tags, they all have a microchip on, and they're, it's like how us having a passport. So cows, sheep, um, goats, and pigs in this country have to have an ear tag, and um, that's their that animal's unique number. That, that animal. So. so what does it tell you about them? What's the number refer to? So it tells you um, basically <laughs> um, where, where, which farm, which holding it's kept at, yeah. what breed, what age, etc, um, etc. Et A lot of details on there. Cool. Two um, and the mum, the land race, uh, the breed is land race, which is a rare breed and it uh, the land races were actually imported in this country in 1949 after the Second World War from Sweden. And they're quite a very rare breed. Um, 
there actually is more Tamworths in this country than Landrace. Um, and you can see the length of them. You know, they're quite a commercial pig, really. So, a nice pig. And the mum here, um, she's called Babe. And she's got lovely blue eyes. <laughs> and that's a, a good picture of her. It's RUQ18, it's her e tag. RUQ18. Good girl. And she's got lovely blue eyes, haven't you? Yeah. Lovely blue eyes, this one. Okay, so another question that we had was how do we stop these birds from flying away? Why don't they just all fly off? Can they fly? Um, they can fly, um, however, about once a month um, we clip the wings, clip the feathers, the flight feathers, we should, the secondary feathers on the wings. And I personally do both sides. Um, some people do one side to make them, um, you know, not the balance, but um, I actually, yeah. So a little bit more behind the scenes access. I'm now down in the middle of home farm and I'm in one of the cattle sheds. So at this time of year most of our cows are out grazing. However, the ladies who are in here are yet to calve. So we tend to calve the end of May through into June. And as soon as the cow has calved, then and we're happy that the calf has suckled. Um, it's healthy, mum's doing well, then they will head straight out onto pasture, onto the grass. So that's where they will be healthiest, and um, the calves will grow in best, the mothers will produce the most milk, but we really want to make sure everything's good before they head out onto part of the 800 acres of farmed estate here. Give someone else to say hello. <laughs> uh, this shed is a mix of cows, um, mainly beef shorthorn, beef shorthorn cross, white bred shorthorns um, are, who are also a rare breed alongside venals but I think all the venals are out um, and some cross breeds in there as well because we work with a few different bulls so this just gives you an idea of their usual living quarters these ladies here are quite happy very pregnant enjoying a bit of peace and relaxation before the babies arrive and plenty of food in front of them so this stuff here is silage which is basically just pickled grass so it was all chopped from the fields last summer and um, brought into the big silage pit um, and left to basically pickle to mature um, into what is quite a treat for the cows so it's got quite um, an acidic smell that makes it easier for them to digest when it's like that and it keeps them happy and healthy so even though they're inside they're still basically eating grass this is their winter ration, even though we're now into summer. So as fresh as can be, brand new calf born about two minutes ago. So mum's doing a great job. She's licking it, cleaning it, and that just encourages it to breathe, to keep moving, and it just forms that bond between mother and calf. So that's exactly what you want. A nice easy birth, she's managed it all by herself and she's immediately bonding with her calf. So within the next hour probably that calf will get to its feet and we'll start looking to feed from mum and get the best first colostrum from it. Um, so that gives it protection, immunity, um, gives it the best start in life. So absolutely delightful. What I'm standing in front of just now is probably not looking like much to you but basically it's an entire winter's worth of cows, cows food so this is the face of the silage pit <laughs> and I'll just turn it around so you can have a better look so just like was in the shed with the cows this is our silage <laughs> and this is the end of what was cut last year so this silage was grass in the field um, up to about this time last year actually, we'll be due to go to silage in the next few weeks here um, and it's brought in by tractor and trailer, so it's chopped, mowed down, chopped up, dried out a bit and then brought in by tractor and trailer by the bucket load and fills up this massive, massive pit Okay, and this is just some of it left 
need to refill all of this to start again to feed the cows next winter. So it's quite a job. There we go.